Hello everyone, welcome to Cherry Avenue Christian Church Online. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Before we get into our worship and message, let me remind you that we're going to be launching new children's classes soon. And for those who are planning to volunteer and weren't able to be at the earlier training sessions, we're having one on Wednesday, August 17th at 6. And so if you haven't been able to get to a session yet, I hope you'll be able to join us for this one on the 17th. Well, we're continuing our series, What God Says in His Word About His Word. And after a time of worship through song, we'll have today's message, There's Never a Bible Around When You Need One. to the end of our series of sermons, and I'm kind of bummed about it. <laughs> I've really enjoyed this series, I truly have. What God says in his word about his word has been a lot of fun for me to put together. I hope you've enjoyed it with me as well. Thank you, I thought you did. Have you, have you ever noticed, I want to end in a special way today, okay? But have you ever noticed that uh, there's, there never seems to be a Bible around when you need one? Have you found that to be true? Maybe you're talking to a family member. I'm not talking about on your phones, and I'll get to that in a minute. Maybe you're talking to a family member, and they ask you about something at church, and you struggle a little bit, and you wrestle a little bit. Where is that in the Bible? And there never seems to be a Bible around when you need one. Or your neighbor asks you something. You're cutting the grass, and he's trimming his hedge, and, and he says, hey, listen, I heard that that you're a believer, can you help me with this issue? And you're saying, where is that again? What's that verse again? There never seems to be a Bible around when you need one. I was in Starbucks just last week. God seems to bring people into my life that, uh, well, that make for great sermon illustrations. <laughs> I was in Starbucks last week, and you know, when you go to these little coffee shops, you don't really know people. They're not really your friends, but you know them, you know them by face, and they are a friendly face. They are a familiar face, and you're a familiar face to them, and you kind of say, hey, and they kind of say, hey. Well, this guy walked up to me the other day, and he said, hey, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, guilty as charged. And he said, what happens to us when we die? I said, oh no, God's doing something here, even today in this coffee shop. See, what happens to our body when we die? And then he says, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, 
And he said, when we buy, die, our uh, bodies go in the grave, but then our spirits go in this place called, and he said, purgatory. He didn't say purgatory, he said purgatory. <laughs> and he said, that's why we got to pray for them to get out of purgatory so they can go to heaven. He said, that true? And I said, no, not at all. <laughs> I said, no, there's not such thing as purgatory in the Bible or purgatory either. And he said, so what happens when we die? And I thought to myself, there's never a Bible around when you need one. And I said, well, you are familiar with Easter, right? And he said, yeah, yeah, I know about Easter. It comes around once a year. <laughs> and I, and I, he said, it's one of the two times I go to church. And I said, well, you remember when Jesus was on the cross? He said, yeah, I've heard about that. And I said, there was a guy over here on this side of him. And the guy over here on this side of me, he goes, yeah, yeah, the thieves. And I said, right. I said, both were hurling insults at him for a time. And then one of the thieves on the other side of Jesus said, hey, wait a minute. He came to his senses and says, this guy's real. He's legit. Now, I, I paraphrased that. And he turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I said, remember what Jesus said? He said to him, today. You will be with me in paradise. I said, do you realize that the Bible says when we are absent from the body, we're in the presence of the Lord? And he says, does the Bible say that? And I said, yes. And he said, are you sure? And I said, I am very sure. <laughs> I said, it's in Luke chapter 23. You can check it out. And he said, so tell me what happens to our bodies when we die. I mean, the bodies when we die. I said, well, you can't take this body with you to heaven when you go. I said, would you really want to? He said, no. And I pointed across the street where I was sitting. <laughs> and I said, see that cemetery over there? Holly Memorial Gardens. He said, yeah. I said, well, there's a lot of bodies laying underground in that cemetery. I said, guess what? Some of them are believers. And I said, one day, Jesus is going to return. I said, one day, he's coming back for his own, his children, his Christians, the believers. And I said, get a load of this. I said, can you imagine some of those graves over there just splitting open? And the tombstone's kind of being turned over? <laughs> And he said, is that in the Bible? I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, I don't know how it's going to happen. But I said, the Bible says one day the Lord's going to return. And with a shout and a voice of the arch archangel and the command of God, trumpet call of God, Jesus is going to come back in the clouds and he, the, the dead in Christ will rise first, the Bible says. And then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds, the Bible says, to meet the Lord in the air. We'll be with the Lord forever. <laughs> and then I pointed to the clouds that happened to be in the air, right above forest lakes. And I said, can you imagine? One day, those clouds right there just split apart. And I said, Jesus, in a moment... Gather up his own. He says, the Bible say that? I said, yes, it does. First Thessalonians chapter 4. He said, are you sure? I said, I am very sure. I said, you know how quickly will take place? He said, how quickly? I said, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. I said, how fast can you blink your eye? He went, I don't know. <laughs> I said, that's how fast it'll happen. He said, now tell me something. Is that in the Bible? I said, you better believe it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he said, are you sure? And I said, very sure. Last thing I heard him say as he walked out of the coffee shop that day was, wow, I got to read my Bible more. You see, there's never... Bible around when you need one. So instead of having a Bible in our hands all the time, we need to have the Bible where? In our hearts. 
Today's message as we end the series for this series is going to be helpful hints about getting the Bible in your heart. Practical principles for practicing holding and handling the Word of God. We're in Deuteronomy. That's in the Old Testament. And we're in chapter 17 of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. And I want you to find it, if you will, because I'm going to start off giving you some background, giving you some context of where we're at. Deuteronomy, fifth book, chapter 17. And by the way, for those of you who say, you know what, Lindsay, I always got a Bible with me because I always got my telephone with me. <laughs> by the way, we don't call it a telephone anymore, do we? <laughs> That's something used to hang on the wall of my kitchen when I was a little boy. Now we call it a cell phone. Now we call it an iPad. Now we call it whatever. But you know what? I'm not talking about that because, you know, when you're sitting in a coffee shop and you have your cell phone with you, and a person asks you a question about the Bible, if you have one of those apps, it's great and everything, but you better be, you better be able to tell where you got to pull it up from, right? Still got to have it in your heart. Still got to know where to go. It's just a tool. So Deuteronomy chapter 17, we're talking about there's never a Bible around when you need it, helpful hints for handling God's word. I'm going to start at verse 4. It's not the meat of our subject for today, but I want to give you some background, some context, because Moses is preparing the people of God to enter into the promised land that God has promised to them. Now, Moses wouldn't take them into the promised land. Joshua would, but Moses is preparing his people to enter the promised land. Now, in verses 14 through 17, Moses gives them some instruction about the king that would later on be the king over the Israelites. Listen as I read. You won't have this on your outline. You will not have this on the screen. Just listen to what Moses says, and then we'll pick up at 18 as we begin the meat of our subject for today. When you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settle in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Listen to what Moses says. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. He must be a man of the people, okay? Do not place a foreigner over you. One who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, he writes, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. In other words, to be a man of the people, to be among the people, to be like the people as you lead the people, he says. Verse 17. This king must not take many wives. <laughs> I mean, living with one is hard enough, isn't it, guys? <laughs> I didn't even say that. Must not take many wives. Notice why he says this. Listen carefully. Or his heart will be led astray. We must have an undivided heart. And many wives can lead our heart astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. These were just some of the parameters that God set down for the first king of Israel that was to come when they entered the promised land. Now, let's pick up at verse 18. Now, you do have this on your outline, and we will have this on our screens. This is helpful hints, and it's speaking to this first king of Israel that would come, but it also gives us helpful hints for handling God's word in our own life. I'm going to read verse 18. Look at it with me. When he, the king, to come, takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write down for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. Now, what is Moses saying about this king that was to come? He is saying it's important in God's sight for the king who would lead over the Israelites to write a copy of, write a copy of the law given to the people in his own hand. I think this is interesting, and it applies to us today. I'm going to give you a challenge. Write it down, folks. 
write it down. The exercise of writing God's word out with your own hand and by your own hand is tremendously powerful. Write it down. Do you realize Moses was talking about the king to come? Now, in the kingdom, the king was the king. He had servants. He had secretaries. He had associates. He had scribes. He could have said, make me a copy of the law. But that's not what God said. God said this. He said that this king, as he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write down for himself on a scroll a copy of this law. Now, some people are uh, think differently about what this law is. It could just be the Ten Commandments. It could be the entire book of Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy, by by the way, means second law. Okay, Or it could mean uh, the king was to sit down and painstakingly write out the first five books of the Bible that we have, the Torah. Either way, he was to write it in his own hand. Why? One, God said to do it. And two, it was a wonderful way to start to watch carefully and see carefully the law and the word of God. Write it down, folks. Write it down. I'll give you a challenge. This week, pick out two, three, four, five, six verses of Scripture and read them carefully and then write them down. That means you got to have your hand, if you're right hand, you got to have your hand over here and you got to write over here. You got to follow where you're going. You got to be very, very careful. And if you notice in the Scripture for today, verse 18, it says, taken from that of the Levitical priests. And it gives the impression that the Levitical priests would be watching over everything this king wrote to make sure that he wrote everything, every jot, every tittle of the Hebrew language accurately when he copied this law. It was so important that the king do this. What happens when we read something and then we copy it as we write something by hand? it starts to get into our hearts. We have to be very, very careful when we write something by hand. I like writing things by hand. Some of y'all have already gotten a card from me, a handwritten note saying, I was thinking about you. My handwriting's not all that great, okay? At least my wife says so. I, I can read it easy. But when we write something by hand, it takes time, not just typing it, It takes painstaking effort, and God wanted his king to write it out. And folks, I want you to do the same by your own hand. I'm going to take us over to 1 Thessalonians. No, excuse me. I'm going to take us over to uh, Timothy. The book of Timothy, it's uh, chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to find it in a second. Here it is. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is writing this to his little apprentice, Timothy, his young apprentice, and he is saying this in chapter 4, verse 7. He says, train yourself, Timothy, to be godly. Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. He says, train yourself to be godly. Notice he didn't say try. He said train. He said discipline yourself, train yourself, practice, practice, practice. Pull the Bible out and do something that folks these days don't ever do anymore. Get a pen and a piece of paper (laughs) and just write it down. You know what? The pen and a piece of paper is becoming obsolete in our society these days. We've got everything on the phone. And I have a phone too. I like my phone. I like my computer. But pull out a yellow pad a legal yellow pad, and bring out a pen and write it down. It's amazing when you do the training that goes into writing out Scripture and how it will dig down deep into your soul when you do. This is how I memorize Scripture. First, I'll read it, and then I'll write it, and then I'll rehearse it out loud without looking, And I have to do it several times, and then I'll recite it. So you read it, you write it, you rehearse it, and then you recite it. Lindsay, that's a lot of work. It's training, folks. Training for godliness. Bearing it in your heart because 
Sometimes there's not a Bible around when you need one. Now look at the second thing I want you to see. Not only was this king to write it down, but he was to keep it close. Keep it close. This is wonderful. It really is. Look at the very first part of verse 19. The very first part. Not only is this king to write it down himself in his own hand, but it says here, it is to be with him. This scroll of the law that he writes by hand in front of the Levitical priesthood was to be with him. Keep it close, folks. Keep it close. When you memorize something, it's about as close to you as it's going to get. When you write it down, it'll help you remember it, and then you've got to keep it close. If you've ever been in the Chick-fil-A that is up north of town in the Lowe's parking lot across from Woodbrook, if you've ever been in that building, I want you to know something. You, as you walked in that building and ordered your Chick-fil-A sandwich, you were walking on Scripture. Do you realize that? You were. The owner, Walter, when that building was being built, he came to me and said, Lindsay, I want you to come over during the construction of this building, Chick-fil-A building. I want you to pray over the building in its construction phase. Bring some people from church and pray over the business. Pray over the customers to come. Pray that we would make an impact in our community. And I said, I'll do you better than that. And I said, I'll bring a bunch of people over there with markers, and we'll mark up the floor with Scripture all over it. And we did. <laughs> you should have seen the construction workers' faces. <laughs> what are those guys doing? Until they started reading what we were writing. And then they got excited. There are Scriptures on the floor under the tile on the concrete of that Lowe's building out there north of town. And yours truly were one of the people that got uh, bruises on his knees on the concrete writing them. I'll tell you that because you know what I want us to do? There's a construction project going on downstairs in this building. Carpet's going to be ripped up in the children's department and in the nursery in just a couple of weeks. You know what I want us to do? You've already guessed it. I want us to go down there after they rip up the old carpet to put down the new carpet, and I want us to kind of elbow some of those workers out of the way and say, we got some scripture right here on our children's floors. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? Matthew 19, 14. Let the little children come unto me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Wouldn't that be great? Jeremiah 31 3 I have loved you with an everlasting love write it on the concrete it's going to be covered up with carpet but we'll know it's there and you know which I like the best <laughs> I'm going to put this in the nursery <laughs> it's going to be awesome <laughs> I'm going to write this one in the nursery 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 51, you know what it says? It's totally out of context, but I'm going to put it in the nursery. <laughs> it says, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. <laughs> you look it up, it says that. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Totally out of context. But I'll put that in our nursery. So any of you nursery workers go in there to go, oh my goodness, they're not going to sleep in here and they're all going to need to be changed. Keep it close, folks. Let's keep the word close. Let's write it down. Let's have it in our hearts. Let's get big markers and make a difference. And I know right now that my wife is thinking, because her and Christy are in charge of this project downstairs, she's going to think, Lindsay, those, those guys are going to come in and rip the carpet. They're going to put the other carpet right back on top of it. You've got to hurry up. We're going to push them out of the way, and we're going to put some scripture down so our kids will be learning on the word. How's that? You want to help me with it, you're more than welcome. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'm going to be ready. <laughs> I'll be ready. So last thing, the, I, I say this, and I get a little chuckle at myself when I say it, but I'm going to get serious now. Over in the book of Amos, the book of Amos, it is an amazing scripture here. The prophet Amos, Old Testament, chapter 8, verse 11. Listen what happens. If this is not today, I don't know what is. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, 
when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. There are some churches that are meeting this morning that rarely even open this word anymore. Now I want to say, what are you doing if you're not opening the word of God? There's a famine in our land, folks. There are people hungry for the word of the Lord. There are little ones that need to be raised up in the nurture and the training and admonition of our Lord so that by prayer we can capture them later on for him. We've got to write it down. Train yourself to be godly. We've got to keep it close. Write it down, have it close. And then I want you to see this. The, la- uh, the, the third point is this. We've got to consult it continuously. Look at this with me. Uh, the next section in verse 19, it says this. And he, the king, is to read it all the days of his life. Read it all the days of his life. Consult it continually. Let it be in front of your face continually. Let it be in your heart continually. Let it be in your head continually. Read it, know it, obey it, act it out, and live it. That's what he's saying right there. He's talking about the king here. Not some uh, peasant, but the king. The king. Consult his word continuously. Over in Joshua, I'm not going to turn there, but I think the scripture will be up on the screen. I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. Joshua is going to lead the people into the promised land, not Moses, but Joshua. And God says, be courageous, be very courageous, because you're going to lead my people. And then he says, I want you not to stray from this book to the right or to the left. I want you to have this word in your heart. And then he says, I want you to meditate on it day and night. Meditate all the time, Joshua, as you lead my people. Have it close and consult it continuously. I'm going to admit something to you right now. I'm going to confess this. This is the truth. I do a poor job of meditating on the Word. I do. And I don't mean sitting down with my legs crossed in a lotus position saying, oh, I'm not talking about that. Okay? But I do a poor job of meditating on the Word. Why? Because my mind doesn't quit. I can't be quiet. It's tough for me to sit still. Imagine that. Okay? It's tough. Elder at Maple Grove, years ago, Elder came to me when I was serving up there, and he held keys in his hand. He said, Lindsay, hold out your hand. Held up my hand, he dropped keys in my hand. He said, those are keys to a timeshare resort that I uh, uh, have a party, um, I'm a party to. I'm giving you these keys. You can go up there and just be by yourself for 72 hours. You got three days to meditate on the Word. Just take your Bible. There's no television. There's no internet. There's nothing but you and the wilderness and the lake. You can sit on the deck. You can read the Bible. You can pray. And I said, thanks a lot. And I went. And after three hours, I was calling Wendy. I'm coming home. (laughs) I said, where are all the people? Folks, I love the clamor of a crowd because I'm an extrovert. It's the way I'm made. I can't help it. I love the noise that's in here on a sunny morning before we get started. That's why I wait for a few minutes after 10, if you really want to know the truth, to get this service started. Because I hear you having fun. I hear you fellowshipping. I hear you, the clamor of the crowd. Well, after about three and a half hours of prayer, God said, Lindsay, that's all I want to hear from you. So I said, honey, I'm coming home. Now, I don't want to discourage you if you have a timeshare somewhere you'd like for me to participate in. (laughs) I don't want to discourage you from dropping keys in my hand one day, but I'm just telling you this is tough for me. We are to consult God's word continuously, even when we're not all that good at it. Now, I do write the word I do keep it close. I do memorize the word, but I'm telling you, it's tough for me not to be around people. You give me energy, okay? Now, here are the benefits, and we're going to close with this, okay? Because he gives us what I call a henna clause, and it's called so that. Look at this with me. The last thing I want you to see is so that. Verse 19 and following, so that. So that the king 
may learn to what? Revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees uh, and not to consider himself better than the other fellow, uh, fellow Israelites and or turn from the law. Watch this. He, then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom. What is the benefits of training in godliness? What is the benefits of writing it down? What's the benefits of keeping it close? What is the benefits of consulting the word continuously? We will have a healthy fear of our God. Is that important? You better believe it. Is it in the Bible? Yes, it is. Are you sure? Very sure. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the fear of the Lord is beginning of knowledge, the Bible says, Proverbs chapter 1. I had a lady meet me one day in the foyer of the church where I was serving, and I was talking about the fear of the Lord. And she said, Lindsay, I disagree with you. And I said, that's impossible. I'm always right. And she said, I disagree with you. Why should I be afraid of the Lord? I didn't say be afraid of the Lord. I said revere his name. Hold him in awesome respect. That's what it means to have a healthy fear of the Lord. We've lost that in our nation today. A healthy fear, respect, sense of awe for our Lord. That's what he says we will have when we train ourselves in this way. Also, we'll be able to humbly lead others. If you tell me, Lindsay, I'm not a leader. Yes, you are. You impact people's lives wherever you go. You may not know it, but you do. We humbly lead others, but not considering ourselves better than others. And then, I like the last one best. We, when we follow this pattern and this principle we will leave a lasting legacy for those who come. It says right here, and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. You want to leave a legacy for the Lord with your children, with your grandchildren, with your friends, with your neighbors, with your extended family? Follow these guidelines, and God says he will direct their paths. <laughs> you see, there's never a Bible around, really, when you need one. Look at the very last quote with me. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but it is a habit. Why don't we develop some good habits? Start developing a good habit today. Just pick a few scriptures. It doesn't matter. If you say to me, Lindsay, where do I start? I say, just go like this. Because every single syllable in here is a word from the Lord. God breathe. Just start writing it down and see where God takes you. See what he will do with you. Let me tell you something. In order to do any of this, you have to surrender all. We sing the song that talks about the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I mean, that he would give his own son as a sacrifice for the very people who had broken our relationship with him through our sin is beyond amazing. But he did, and that's why we spend time each week in communion. Because we want to make sure we always remember what he did for us. And the bread and the cup remind us of the body and blood of Christ and the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love he has for us. Scripture says the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. He goes on to say, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for the incredible love you have for us and how you demonstrated that at Calvary. We thank you for the bread and the cup and the reminder they are of the sacrifice Jesus made for us. And we pray that as we take them today, we'll be emboldened to share your incredible love with those who don't know it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, thanks for making us a part of your worship today, and I hope you'll join us this week for our Wednesday encouragement as well. We like to try to provide a little lift in the middle of the week, and so please join us for that. Have a great week. God bless.